Okay, brethren, let's prepare our hearts to study God's Word. Would you please turn your Bibles to Psalm 18. Psalm 18. 1 8. We have been studying from this Psalm, or rather, the book of Psalms, and uh, completed the 17 Psalms. And now we move on to the 18th Psalm, which in the title says, To the chief musician, a Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said. So the words of this Psalm are set against this historical setting of David's life where he came to the throne of Israel as the second king of Israel. But he's the one whom God has chosen and whose throne is forever and ever in the sense that it is in his line that Jesus would be born. Jesus would be known as David's son as he was in the line of David and Jesus will reign forever and ever as we know, he will not only come again to this world and establish his kingdom on earth and rule from Jerusalem uh, for a thousand years, and thereafter he shall usher us into the eternal kingdom that he has prepared. Now, we know this truth clearly in the scriptures. Now, I'm not going into all those passages now, but just summarize it. So David's psalms are really a psalm that is born out of his thanksgiving for God choosing him to be his servant. Though he is king at this point of time and he's writing this psalm, his heart is not proud or arrogant. He is not exalted within himself. He is very humble, as we saw in the title. He says, David, the servant of the Lord. David, he didn't say David, the king of Jerusalem or king of Israel. But he chose to say, David, the servant of the Lord. He knows his appointment as a king is not for his own greatness or his own glory, but for the praise of God. On the throne, he's a servant of God. And we must always remember this even in our life. No matter what position or what uh, status of life we may receive, if you are a true Christian, you must know that's God's gift to you. That's a place that God has prepared for you to be. Uh, whether you are married or not, you must remember you are status as a single or as a, as a married person. It's a gift from God. It has its challenges. It is not easy to be a single. It's not easy to be married as well. To remain married till death do us part is a big challenge. And no one should take that position for granted. And those of us who are called in the church to be pastors, preachers, elders, deacons, and so on, or teaching children, or serving in the choir, or in some other ministries of the church, they are all God's appointment to us. And we must always feel a sense of duty toward God, and not duty for our own promotion in any way, but duty born out of a loving and grateful heart that says, God has been so kind to me. I'm a sinner. I should be doomed to hell. But God has shown so much mercy toward me. I must be a servant of God. But this life is not going to be easy. Wherever God appoint you, uh, you will face struggles. The Bible always t tells us that. And so when we assume our God-given responsibilities, our roles in life, we must be ready to accept the challenges that come with it. Sometimes they can be heart-wrenching problems. As soon as God chose David to be the king, he was led into all sorts of troubles. Not that he went looking around for trouble. He was one of the most congenial person, most loving, most meek and gracious person, ever willing to work along. And he, out of his duty as a, as a filial son, went to look after the well-being of his, son, his older brothers in the army 
because the father asked him to go and find how his brothers are doing. And when he was there, he, he heard the shouting and the screaming of the giant Goliath, the, the, the mighty warrior of the Philistines. And he was challenging, challenging the Israelites to come out and fight him. And there was no one to fight him. And he felt very embarrassed by the situation. How come there is not one Jew, one who loved God, to go out and face this mighty man? He was a giant. And suddenly David said, is there not a cause? How can we let this man deride our God and our nation? And people heard it. They brought him to King Saul, the, the king of the Jews at that time. And the king said, oh, you want to really fight? Then put on the armor. The king gave his royal armor to him. But King Saul was a very large-sized man. David cannot wear it. He said, sir, I can't wear it and walk. He removed them. And he walked with a few stones that he picked up from the riverbed. And with one throw of the stone, he brought down the giant. I don't have to tell the story. You know it. But just to remind you, since that day of victory that God gave, his trouble began in a way that we can never imagine. King Saul became jealous because the Jews gave a lot of praise to David. They said David killed 10,000 and Saul killed 1,000. And they became jealous. I mean, sorry, King Saul became jealous when he heard the honor and the praise that David received from the people. David never asked for it. People out of their joy and thanksgiving, they, they thank God for David. But King Saul was full of jealousy. He sought to kill him so many times. He escaped, as we say, by the skin of the tooth. There was one time King Saul was troubled by demonic spirit. He was sort of mentally deranged, quite mad. And David was told about it. David was a good musician. He not only can play harp, he would even invent new musical instruments to praise God. And he comes around and he sings songs for David. He plays his harp. And King Saul become comforted from the torment he felt. And when he is relaxing, Suddenly, he become jealous toward David. And there's one occasion he took the javelin, the spear, and threw at David, who was just sitting right in front of him. By the grace of God, David escaped that murderous attempt of the king. And he runs away. And then he became a fugitive. In fact, every Sunday in the evening teaching, we are in our evening teaching ministry on Sunday, we are learning about King Saul, and right now we are learning about the way King Saul made David a fugitive. And I hope you will come and learn. It's a two interesting parallel studies we have on Sunday. Sunday morning, we learn Psalms. A lot of Psalms are David's Psalms, and they are set against uh, King Saul and David's relationship and what happened in those days. So the evening study would help you a great deal to appreciate the book of Psalms. And I hope you come. Even in the evening at 6 p.m., we have a worship service where we will learn God's word. Now, we know that David being a fugitive, he had to run all over Israel. Everywhere he go, he was in danger because King Saul had his men waiting to kill him. But David was specially protected by God. When he was surrounded by enemies everywhere, when he thought his life is really in great danger and he can never escape, the Lord always gave him a way of escape. And he survived all the murderous attempt by King Saul and his army. He survived. And while he was trying to escape as a fugitive, running from place to place. He also took upon himself responsibilities to protect Israel. You see, King Saul was a very selfish man. He cared less and less 
for the country as his numbers on the throne increased. He was not one who, uh, one who grew in responsibility. The more power he got, the more relaxed he became and more self-oriented. He cared less. And so when the enemies attacked Israel, like Philistines, people were in great distress. Normally these um, invading forces of countries that or people lived around Israel happened during the harvest season. They, they let the Jews work in the field and they grow their grain. But during the harvest, they will attack to take away all the grain in the land. And that they did consistently year after year. And they would attack different towns and different villages and cities to take away their, their hard-earned wealth. And if the king would not bother to place his army to protect these areas of Israel, all the wealth would be taken. And he, he didn't care much. He was more interested in protecting himself and making sure David is killed so he can feel happy. Even his son Jonathan told him, no, 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 this is not the way. God chose David already. I will not succeed you. But King Saul was angry with his son for saying that David is the appointed king and not him. And he even tried to kill his son by throwing the spear at him. And we know he was mad about himself. He was mad about exalting himself and securing the highest place in the land. David was never seeking after the place. David was always hiding away, even though David knew in his heart that he was chosen by God because Prophet Samuel anointed him and told him, you will you'll be the next king. David never attempted to overthrow King Saul. He had opportunities to kill King David. With one stab, he could have killed. Many, many opportunities. But David never raised his hand against the Lord's anointed. Even though King Saul was quite wicked in his ways, God was the one who put him there. So David said, I won't touch him. When God removes him, let him be removed. And then I will take the place. He was never in a hurry. But the more time was given to King Saul, the more wickedness did he uh, commit against David. And so the setting of this psalm is a very, very harrowing period that David went through. But I also must remind you, David struggles before he became a king from King Saul, happened while he was in his youthful days, late teens and 20s. Because when he became a king, he was only 30 years old. So he, before he ascended the throne, he was under great pressure. Just imagine all the young adults who are listening to me, all those who are in the 20s. Can you imagine being chased every day? You can't stay in a house. You have to move from place to place. You can't dwell in the cities. You must try to find caves to hide. You go into woods. You go into uh, wilderness, arid places where you cannot really survive, but you go there just to protect your own life. Do you really want to live such a life? If God were to say, I have chosen you for a great purpose, but this is how it's going to be. Most of us would be very displeased. We would say, how can God be a loving God? We will mutter in our hearts all kinds of dissatisfied um, thoughts and words toward God. Some of us want to get married, and when we get married, and when life is difficult and the spouse do not treat us as we like, we become very annoyed and we say, what kind of God, what kind of God? I'm not going to obey God's word. I'm not going to love my wife. I'm not going to submit to my husband. I cannot accept. I want to quit. I don't want this kind of children. I don't care. Our dissatisfaction with our responsibilities because there are difficulties. 
Dear friends, when troubles increase, God is ever near you. David learned that. Patience, endurance is not going to lead you to destruction and defeat. Patience and endurance will lead you to success and triumph. That's the story you have in this long psalm. There are 50 verses in the psalm. We are not able to study all of them. Let me just quickly give you a division of the psalm, and then we look at the first part of the psalm, uh, which uh, takes you from verse 1 to 19. Okay, when you study the psalm carefully, you will see there are three major sections, three major sections. First is uh, a section where David uh, give praise to God. So let's call it the opening praise. And that's found in verses 1 to 3. Verses 1 to 3. And then you see from verse 4 all the way uh, to verse 15. A section where uh, David's various experiences of life being shared. We can further subdivide that. I will mention that later. So, verses, sorry, did I, I, I'm not sure whether I correctly said it. Verses 4 to 45. I might have said the last verse wrongly. Verses 4 to 45 is a section where various uh, experiences of David are mentioned. And then, once again, he burst forth in thanksgiving and praise. So that's his closing praise in verses 46 to 50. So, once again, very quickly, verses 1 to 3 is the opening praise. In the middle, verse 4 to 45, you have David's experience of uh, tragedy and pain and struggle. And then... In the last section, you have the closing praise, verses 46 to 50. Now, when we talk about the middle section, let me further divide that for your understanding. In verses 4 to 19, which we will study today, he describes the pit of peril, pit of destruction that he was going through. In the nine, verses 4, 4 to 19. And as he describes this dangerous time that he had in his life, he talks about his desperation in verses 4 and 5, and then he talks about God coming and being with him in a very peculiar way in verses 6 to 15. So his desperation, God's defense of him, and then God's deliverance in verses 16 to 19. And then in the next Nine verses, 20 to 28, which we will study, God willing, next week. You see, David struggled with moral integrity, ethical integrity. When he became a king, he realized that what matters is not all the glory and the power he received as a king, but God's instruction in life. What matters the most in life? is not feeling good and feeling uh, a sense of control over everything, but having a mind ready to yield to God and be always a servant of God. So he realized that there are struggles in leadership where what matters the most is not personal power gathering or securing but personal commitment to God's principles. So he describes that quite um, extensively in verses 20 to 28, which, God willing, we will study the following week. And then verses 29 to 45, he really tells us the turbulent atmosphere he faced uh, in the leadership. He talks about the military leadership, in verses 29 to 42, and then 43 to 45, he talk about God's leadership in his life. So, the, uh, you, when you read through this psalm, you will be able to recognize 
the whirlpool of trouble through which David came into power and remained a servant of God while he was in power as the king of Israel. This is a psalm that is worth studying so that we, in our time, in our little corners, in our places of responsibility, know how to face our troubles. We all have different troubles. We will never have the same problems that David had. However, David's life is an example for us to follow. After all, David represents Christ in certain ways because Jesus came as a son of David and David was very important in God's plan because God has promised even before David came to the throne that God will bring about a savior, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he'll be born in David's line. And so we know this whole story plays out another great redemptive story of God preparing a savior for us through David. So as we study David's life and David's reflection of his experiences in life, we must remember this is all about we, like David, putting our trust in our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. David knew that God has chosen him uh, to be in the line of Christ who will come as his Savior. So he looked at his great son, not his uh, own son in the sense of human descendant, uh, but his God's son taking the form of a man and being in the line of David as he would be born into this world. And so David understood the messianic uh, predictions that God has made through his line. And there was a, it was very important for him to understand, therefore, he has been chosen by God for a purpose, purpose that is greater than him. You and I may not be in David's position, but as God's children, we are all called for purposes greater than ourselves. And you need to believe that. You are not created for yourself, and you are not left to think for yourself. You are asked to follow the Lord God Almighty's plan for us. Now, what that plan is, is determined by God. Now, it doesn't mean you will be sitting on the throne and you are putting on a lot of ornaments and going around showing off that you are, you know, having a grand life on earth. Some of us are chosen by God to live a very tough life. Maybe living in hut all the days of our life. Very little to spend. Maybe very difficult relationship. Some of you may have very big uh, house. You may have great responsibility. You may become very famous. But you may have your own struggles that nobody else has. Peculiar struggles. Every one of us in this world will have tribulation, as Jesus said. You will have tribulation. But how do we go through it? That's what we want to learn. Now, having come through a great lot of his troubles and ascended the throne, he gives thanks to God, and that's Psalm 18. Take a look. The first three verses, amazing. He opens with a grand song of praise to God. And he says in verse 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Verse 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom will I, I will trust. My buckler, the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. Verse 3, I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. So this opening three verses of praise teaches us David's thankful relationship with God. If you carefully analyze verse 1 and 2, you will see there is a long list of titles of God. And each of those titles are, uh, sorry, uh, each of those titles is preceded by the personal pronoun my. At the end of verse 1, you see the title, Lord, my strength. It refers to God as my strength. You, list, you saw the term my, and then you go to verse 2. The Lord is what? My rock. The Lord is my Fortress, then my deliverer, my God, my strength, 
my buckler, my horn of my salvation, my high tower. There are altogether nine descriptions, including the one in verse 1. In verse 8 alone, there are eight titles of God. Now, some of us might think, oh, David gave all these names to God. No, it's not so much David gave the word, I mean, these names to God. There are some Christians who like to describe God in their own terms. They come up with all kinds of uh, shocking description of God. We should avoid doing it. When David mentioned God as all these, my strength, my fortress, and so on, he was not saying something that he wanted to come up with to describe God. As we know, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. These are experiences God has given to him and taught him who God is. Uh, I have taught in Forreston Bible College and in this church a course called The Names of God. I don't know how many of you have taken that course. Maybe major, a lot of you have heard me preaching that series. Names of God. In the Bible, we have many names of God. And some of these names are given to describe God's nature or God's character. Some of these names reveal God's work. Some of those names describe uh, God's truth, doctrines. But all these names are there to tell the readers of the Bible who God is. And no man can describe God adequately unless God himself reveal his truth. So these names are God's own name that God has revealed to David. Not so much David naming God. It shouldn't be the case. We can name our children. Who are we to name God? It's like a son, a newborn babe or a three-year-old child saying, Mommy, I give you a new name. It's weird. No, your names are given to you by your parents. Uh, that's normally the case. And so we can't name God because we on our own cannot understand how great God is. He is an infinite God. Our puny mind cannot comprehend God. However, God is all, always gracious to come to our state of mind to reveal who he is. And that's how we know God. If God doesn't reveal to us who he is, we will never find him. He's an incomprehensible, unfathomable God who is far greater than we can ever imagine. So if we need to understand him and know him, he has to make himself known to us. And that's what the Bible tells us here. God reveals who he is to, through David. And he says, first of all, his name is the Lord. And that's why David says, I will love thee, O Lord. The word Lord is Yehovah. Some people pronounce Yahweh. Yehovah. In English, we say Jehovah. That means I'm the great I am. He has always been an, a God who exists. The great I am. I am that I am. There was not a time when he was absent. And there is no time where he's absent. If you talk about the past, if you talk about the future, you talk about the present, it's all in him. There is no time outside him. All the time is inside him because he is eternal, an eternal God. Time is within him. So yesterday, today, and tomorrow, all are a present now. To us, we are outside time. We are reliant on time. God is not reliant on time. Time is reliant on God. God created time. And so he says, I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. I'm the Alpha and Omega. In him all things began and he consummates all things. So the name Lord tells us he is eternal God. He's an infinite God. He is the highest God that there is. There is no other God but the God of Israel who is revealed in his word as Lord. L-O-R-D in capital letter in the Bible is translation of the name Jehovah or Jehovah as we say, which means 
He is an ever-present eternal God. And concerning him, David says, he is my strength. In a very personal way, he describes God. He has been my strength. In fact, that word strength in verse 1 can be translated as rock. A solid rock. And then again, he uses another Hebrew word in verse 2 and says, the Lord is my rock. And here it is, that Hebrew word is translated as rock. Rock is a symbol of strength, steadiness, steadfastness. He's unmoving. You can trust him. The Lord is dependable. He's the rock. And he's my fortress. Now, there are man-made fortresses. David could not hide behind a fortress. He was on the run. He was a fugitive. But he had a better fortress than all other fortresses man have ever made. And that is God himself. He says, God is my fortress. I may live in open field. I may be running from place to place. But I am not killed by my enemies, even by the king's soul and his army. Because God is my fortress. Dear friends, it's not abundance of things that you possess. It is not the great name and great houses and cars and wealth that you have that gives you safety. All these things are useless in the day of danger. Yeah? Money cannot save you from death. You can have all the money. You can have the best specialist, medical specialist in the world to attend to you. But when danger comes, you are a helpless victim. You survived only because God has been gracious to you. And so David says, I have enemies surrounding me, but God has been my fortress. They trouble me, they chase me around, they look for my life, they, they put me always in harm's way, but God was my fortress. And then he says about God, God, my God, he says, he's my God. He, God availed himself to me. He's mine and I'm his. He's my God. You know, th there is no better friend than God himself. You and me must rejoice. People may abandon us. As in one place, David says in Psalm 27, my father and mother may forsake me but the Lord will take me up. Sometimes the dearest and the closest and the ne nearest will abandon us. It's very painful. Yeah. We may be lonely at times. It can be by death our nearest and dearest may be removed. How many times we have seen this happening in this church and in other places. Young couple getting married and suddenly the poor girl finds herself to be a widow or the other way around. We have seen this happening. One of the things I remind children, uh, young people who get married is that, especially I tell the girls, you know, you must be prepared to be a widow. Because you never know. Never know when tragedy would hit. But you will never be alone. In your loneliness, the presence of God is there. Now we bring up our children so they may be with us when we are old. But then they may go away. They may not be with us. We might find ourselves alone in our old age. But God is with us. You can always say, He is my strength. He is my fortress. He is my God. He is my God. He will be faithful to me to look after me. He created me. He will provide, protect, and guide me. And then he also says about God, my buckler. The word buckler is an old English word that can mean a shield. Well, the Hebrew word used here by David refers to a protective gear that soldiers would wear. It's something that covered the whole body. So that defensive weapon they used was known as buckler. You see, God is my defense. Many times, David, though a very skilled warrior, a mighty man on his own, uh, he says, look, between me and death, there's only one defense, and that's my God. It's not my sword. It's not my skill to fight. It is God who protects me. 
Yes, that doesn't mean he didn't fight. He fought, he took the arms, he, he was ever ready to fight. But he know no matter how much he uh, trained himself and press himself in the battle, ultimate protection and victory comes from God. And he ascribed it to God. And then he also says, he's the horn of my salvation. The word horn, of course, reminds us animal horn. When the animals show its horn, we better run. They're showing the strength. And it's the pride. They threaten one another by shaking their head, showing off their horn. When, when the Hebrew people or the Jews, when they say horn of something, it means they are rejoicing and praising and finding strength in this experience of salvation. Horn of my salvation. The Lord is horn of my salvation. In other words, the fact that I'm saved uh, from all my sins and troubles and I am here to do what God wants you to do is based on the fact that the Lord is my salvation. He is my deliverer. He is my savior. And that gives me confidence. It's not in me. Am I, as your pastor, what's the confidence I have as a pastor? Is it that I'm a perfect man? No, I have my sins. I struggle with lust and greed and all kinds of anger and jealousy in my mind. But I need a sanctified mind. If I don't have a savior, if I don't have the Bible that my savior gave me, if his spirit doesn't work in me, I have no confidence. I'll be the first one to fail as a pastor. What's the assurance of my salvation? What's the assurance of my service to God? It is he himself that he will protect me. He will guide me. He is the horn of my salvation. He is also my high tower. High tower here refers to uh, a tower that normally people built in those days for two purposes. It can be a huge structure. They build very high. And inside, you can go in. There are ladders in many levels. You can you know, hide yourself inside. It's a place of uh, refuge, a hiding place, as well as a place from where they look out for enemies who are coming from far. And God has been his protection, and God has been his lookout, the watchman. The Lord guards. You know, as Psalm 127 says, the keepers of the city do the work, watch the city in vain if the Lord doesn't keep the city. And that's the case in our life. And David understood that clearly. And so he said, oh, look, my God. This is a song of praise, remember. He's praising God not by saying so many things that God has done in this point of time, but just remembering who God is to him. My strength, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, my buckler, my horn of salvation, my high tower. He rejoices in God. And that's how he came through his troubles. As a young man struggling to maintain his life, running from place to place, away from his parents, away from his siblings, not knowing where he will end up next morning, he trusted in God. And he could sleep well in the night, even though he had so many dangers, because he rested in his God. God, thou art my fortress. Thou art my strength. You don't need to be so afraid in life, even though there are reasons for trouble in, in your heart. You may have friends or even spouses or children or parents who, whom you thought would protect you, actually leave you open to all the troubles. Or they become a trouble than a support for you. It happens. It's not time for us to give up. It's not time for us to be too dejected and disheartened. It's time for us to gather our strength in prayer like David. You see, to the knowledge, uh, uh, to, uh, the knowledge that he had about God, caused David to act in three ways. He talks about three things he would do because he's thankful for who God is to him. After saying who God is, he says three things. 
Well, the very first thing you find in verse 1 when he says, I will love thee, O Lord. If God is all these things to me, I will love my God. He didn't say, I love myself or love my wife or love my friends or love my army or love my skill. No. He said, I will love thee, Lord, for thou art my strength. You know, dear friends, in all pursuits of life, in all situations of life, you must learn to love God. Not love yourself. Forget about our experiences. The Lord will take care of us. It's not, yeah, I, I mean, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a pastor. I say this often. Because you are too. In some of my roles are played by you. You are a father or you are a wife, as a spouse. You have certain burdens, which I also have. Maybe different in different homes. I'm a parent. Now I'm a grandparent. I also have my parents. They are still alive, both of them. And that's also a burden I have. I have responsibilities toward them. And recently my responsibility to my parents doubled up when my brother was called home by the Lord. He passed away, my younger brother. So now I have a great burden for my parents. And they are not here. They live in India. So... I have always concerns about their well-being and how they are in their old age. And I have children here. I have a church here. All these are burdens. Sometimes people ask me, how do you balance it? There's no balancing. How can I balance life? Everything is falling on me, you know, all the burdens, all the concerns. There's no balancing. No, we are not in a balancing act. Our duty is to love God. And do what he says. And just submit to it. I don't want to sit here and cry. How come God give this kind of parents? Or how come God give me this kind of children? How come my spouse is there? Yeah, they may fail. Or I may fail them. And they may be upset about it. And it's a very tough time. We don't know how things will turn out next moment. We never know what's the problem that's going to come upon us. We are always at the brink of some trouble. It is in this time you must say, Lord, you are so great. You are all these things I mentioned, my strength, my fortress, my high tower, and so on. And I will love you. It is time for me to realize how good thou art. My troubles are here not to put a distance between you and me, but the troubles are here to draw me closer to you. These troubles cause me to love you and to wait on thee. And that's the second thing he says in verse 2, in the middle of verse 2, he says, in whom I will trust. So he will love the Lord, and he will trust the Lord. I have no one else to turn to. Lord, I have all these responsibilities, but I want to do it in a way that is most honorable in your sight. I don't want to please people. I don't want to please myself. I want to please God, because I love him, and he loves me. He knows the situation that I am in. With all the difficulties, all the hatred I'm undergoing. David, remember, David was going all those opposition and attempt to kill him by King Saul. He was running around without complaining. He says, I love you more. That's really amazing. That's how much he, he trusts God. And he says, no matter what, O oh Lord, you allow all this, but I still trust you. I will trust you. And thirdly, he says in verse 3, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. I will call upon the Lord, meaning I will worship and pray to thee. I will not ever abandon you, God. In all my journeys, in all my desperate a fugitive run from place to place, I will call on you. If I'm here today, I will worship you here, I will call on you. If next moment I have to pack and leave, if I'm on the run, I will flee from this place, calling on you. Wherever I will be, I will always worship you and trust you. Call on thee. And therefore, he says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Worthy to be praised. The word praise comes from the word hallelujah. You know, hallelujah as a root word, halal. Halal in Hebrew language means praise. 
Hallelujah. U is you, and ya at the end is the short form for, for Jehovah, which means Je Jehovah, the Lord. So hallelujah means praise ye the Lord. You praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that word halal is used here, worthy to be praised. He says, no matter where I am, no matter what situation I be, no matter how difficult are the problems I'm facing, my mind is spinning, my, I don't know how to manage this. I'm fleeing. But the Lord is with me. That's why I can flee. He's worthy to be praised. No murmuring, no grievances against God, but just praise. We must learn this, dear brethren. We must be like David. Praising God. Because he's worthy to be loved and trusted. And he's the one who gives me another day. Even though it's full of trouble, I'm here to overcome that trouble. People may betray me. People may attempt to kill me. They may torture me. They may say bad things about me. But these things do not matter because... I'm not going to live, I'm, I'm not living because of them. I'm living because God sustained my life. So even if they make life difficult for me, they cannot destroy me. I have a God who is my defender, who is my fortress. I will trust him. I will love him. I will praise him. And so at the end of verse 3, he said this, So shall I be saved from my enemies. You see, he just ascended the throne. There are many more years to go. He knows there will be attempts against his reign. There can, there can be people, not only from enemies around him, but from within the country, from within the family. You know, one of his sons, Absalom, rose against him and chased David out of the throne for a while. So you know, never know where the trouble comes from. It can come from any place. But he says, being confident, I shall be saved from my enemies. Meaning, the Lord will protect and deliver me. Presence of enemies should not frighten me. Uh, dear friends, some, uh, sometimes a little bit of competition from someone make us so upset we can't sleep and we think life is going to end here. Just because the husband didn't acknowledge us, or the wife was not so happy with us, which they shouldn't. But if just because they got it wrong, don't quit your life and relationships that God has given to you. Bear them and say, God will help me. I'm going to be a good husband. My calling is, uh, is to be a good husband. Even though my wife get it wrong, I must try and be patient and be gracious. God will give me strength. If anybody were to whisper to you that you quit your God-given place, let me tell you who says that to you. The devil and the devilish people. How can we give up on our spouses? How can we give up on our children? How can we give up on our parents just because life is difficult? This world will be so chaotic. Can you imagine what this church will be? If you have a pastor who divorces his wife and don't care for the children, what kind of pastor do you have? If our elders are like that, if our deacons are like that, if you are like that, what kind of church will this be? And that life is full of trouble. Don't think pastor's life is easy. I thank God that the Lord called all my children to serve him full time. That was the only prayer I had. I never said, Lord, make them engineers or doctors or rich men. No, I said, Lord, make them all your servants. And I'm very grateful. But that journey was not easy. My oldest is 28, going to 29. Or maybe already 29. <laughs> now, it was not an easy three decades bringing up kids. They went to schools like all of your children go. It was a struggle. All kinds of temptations for me as a father in bringing up my kids. To keep them in the narrow way of godliness. And praying day and night that they will not be traitors to God but they will return to God if they failed. My children are not perfect children. They went through struggles. When I was reading Andronicus, my second son's testimony, 
He said he came to know the Lord late in his life. I said, what? You've been praying with me every day. You did that, you did this, you sang that song, you wrote this song, you said that. Are they not all testimony of salvation? I'm not sure, Daddy. I never deny God, but he was not special to me. Maybe I become saved later. Say, what will it be? You're right. Thank God you are saved. <laughs> you know, so during that time, of course, you could have been the worst ch child. I know what I have been when I was young, how we can be easily taken away. Oh, the protection of God upon my children. All glory to him. It's never easy to bring up our kids the way God wants us to. But sometimes God throws at us great challenges. I know to dedicate three children God gave, all the three, to the Lord's work. All to be missionary or whatever God wants them to be. It's a big challenge for me. There are people who ask, are you crazy? It's not one enough. And how why do you want to say all the three? I say, I don't know. My wife and I feel very convicted. The Lord who has been good to my father, who is full-time servant of God, and me, full-time servant of God, will take care of my children. And if there is anything that is more important in this world, is harvesters. Harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. We need more pastors and preachers and missionaries than doctors and engineers and nation builders. We have plenty of them. If the church is not burdened by the harvest of God's a vineyard, then who will be? And if I'm going to be a pastor, I better be most burdened than all, of, all others. I'm not saying you shouldn't have burden. And I prayed sincerely, Lord, have mercy. I, don't, I can't change my children's mind. They're influenced by the rest of the world. They also have ambitions. They also want to do great things. They also want to be rich. They want to be jet-setting people. I cannot stop them unless they're so fine God to be so great and wonderful, they yield their life. And I'm very grateful the Lord led them. I'm eternally thankful. As I said this morning in the first service, I feel my duty is done. I can go home to be with the Lord. The Lord gave me a wife when I came to this country. And the Lord gave us three children. And from the beginning, even before they were born, we prayed the children would serve God. Now they are in their places of service for God. I feel like I'm done with my work as far as family is concerned. I'm pretty happy to leave tonight if the Lord would call. Tomorrow, Andronicus will start his service in the church. Who knows? I will be glad to go. But again, it's not for me to choose. I don't want to be a coward. There may be more problems. I know what kind of problem can come. Some of you might say, or somebody outside might say, oh, this Koshia, very clever, he came from India, he studied here, he became a pastor, now he found job for all his three children in the church. Not bad, huh? Very smart, huh? maneuvering, very good. Huh? Huh. I know, I know what is going to be said and what is already said also I know. But I'm not going to be easily given to this kind of pressure? Why? Why don't you try to get your own children? Come, let them work. I welcome them all. You think they want to work in church? With little pay? And all the troubles you have to face? Uncertainty in life? Try, try and persuade your kids. See whether it happens. Even if they come in, they will get out very quickly. God has to work in our children's heart. This is God's work. It's not mine. I can't get my kids to come in here. My second son always said, Daddy, please, please don't force me to be a full-time worker. I, I respect. I, I want to do whatever I can to serve God. Can I work outside and help the church? I said, I don't know. I don't know. You go and find out. I'm not going to force you. But my commitment to God is to tell you what I've prayed to God. And I have no other thing in my heart. He often asked me, especially in his final year, as he was completing his studies in NTU, that, how about this? I will do freelance. I will work outside and then help the church. I said, come on, son. I don't want part-time. If you take work from outside, they will take up all your time. 
And what I can get is just a few hours. Even that, you'll be troubled to give. Then you get married, you have your children. If you are not fully engaged in the Lord's work, you cannot fully bear the burden. I don't want people to just come in and touch and leave. Yes, let the, there are people like this that Lord appoint in the church, members of the church, they come and do a little bit. But I'm asking you with all the gift you have give, God has given, when this place right now need a man who is trained like you, who is going to do that work? I cannot go and enlist all the people in the church. Anyway, you must come not because of me, but God calls you. You must be sure. Otherwise, it's okay. Well, he prayed. The Lord worked in his heart. My wife is on the knees most of the time at home praying for him. And the Lord answered our prayers. And we give glory to God. And you prayed for me. Many of you prayed for Andronicus. Well, we thank God. He's not only saved. In due time, God also called him. This is the Lord's work. He is to be praised. Your family, your children, your work, your business, your place in this church is not something you achieved. Give glory to God. Say in your heart, the Lord has done all this. I should not fret. I should trust him. I must love him. I must call on him. And my life and my family and everything I have belongs to God. It's not good enough to sing all to Jesus, I surrender all to him, I freely give. And then you don't give anything to God. You make sure your heart is yielded to God. Troubles will come. Uncertainties come. Gossips and slander will rise. People may deliberately try to injure us. But we are in the Lord's hand. This life will end now or later. But when we die in Christ, we have the hope of eternity. If not, we are lost forever. Dear friends, time is running very fast. We're going to take 10 more minutes to cover the rest. Come and look at this. Don't get dejected. David is going to take us through a pit of problems, peril that he went through. And see how he went through this pit, really a pit of trouble. See this. Listen to his words. Verse 4 to verse 6. The sorrows of death come past me about. Snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. The snares of death prevented me. I'm sorry, I read again verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him even into his ears. What is he saying? He's saying that sorrows of death, agony of death, deadly fears, deadly troubles compassed him. Twice he said in verse 4 and verse 5, sorrows of death and sorrows of hell compass me. Hell is the translation of the word Sheol in Hebrew, which means the realm of the dead. can sometimes mean uh, grave, sometimes can mean eternal death, sometimes it can simply mean deep trouble, hellish pain and trouble. And so here he uses the word death and hell to talk about how life was. Life was facing death every day. How about that? Living in death. Sometimes we say living hell, right? In modern English, oh, this is a living hell. And some people say it's better to die than living like this. You understand what it means? Many troubles, many sorrows. There is no scope of life itself. It's trouble upon trouble. Not that he did evil, but others are doing evil to him and wanting to see him dead. And so he said, Lord, the sorrows of death, it's not just sorrow of death, it's in plural. There are all kinds of deadly sorrows. Well, who can define this? 
sorrows of death. And then he says in verse 4, floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Ungodly people, wicked people with bad intentions coming against David like floods. Floods, again in plural. Not just one tsunami, many tsunamis trying to devour him. Sorrows of hell compassed me about. Snares, again plural, of death prevented me. Everywhere there were traps to destroy him. It was a treacherous path. Life itself was so treacherous, so painful. If somebody were to come and stab you to death, maybe you die quickly. But if he, every, every minute, take a knife and poke you here and say, how is it? I'm going to kill you. Oh, so painful. And you relax for a while. Next minute, you take the knife and poke again on, in your stomach. You still didn't die, but you're bleeding and it's so painful. And he gives another one on your back, on your neck. Another one on your thigh, on your leg, inch by inch. Sorrows of death compass me. No relief. Constant trouble. A young man in his 20s going through extreme fears of death. We often talk about David as a mighty man. You kill Goliath. He is so strong, courageous. Read this. Before you describe David. David himself says. How troubled he was. How treacherously trapped he was. In this life he had. Verse 6. In my distress. <laughs> now you understand the heaviness of the word distress. In my dis helpless situation. I have no breath in me. I am tired, I am worn, I am weary. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. The, he heard my voice out of his temple. At that time, no, there was no temple yet. This is a reference to the temple in heaven. The Lord from heaven heard me. This poor man cried from this earth. From pangs of death he cried. And my cry came before him, even into his ears. That's why he said, he is my God. He is my strength. He is my fortress. He is my stronghold. Why? The Lord hears my cry. Ah, you mean God would still leave you in your trouble? Yeah. To let you know he's greater than your trouble. You mean God will allow people to betray you? Yes, God would. So you would appreciate there's only one loyal one, one who is faithful, never changing, the immutable one, and that's your God. If you thought your husband is going to be the greatest strength, you are a fool. If you think your wife is going to be the best help, you are a fool. They all will fail because we also fail, right? We are not the best. But if you trust God, even when others fail, you will find strength to rise above the failures of others and the hurts of others and perform yourself as a victorious Christian. I cannot be a pastor after you all walk right with God. I cannot, be, I cannot prepare the sermon after seeing how many people are coming this Sunday. Whether people come or not, even if it's only one soul in this church, I must prepare my sermon as well as I prepared for this day. I can't come here determining how I should pre preach. It is God who determined. My duty is to study, prepare well, and preach. So whether five people or 5,000 people, I must still preach. If you are here to kill me also, I must preach. Look at Jesus. How Jesus was always welcoming people to himself when there was traitors right in. Even there was a traitor right inside his 12 apostles. He knew it to the last minute that Judas was a betrayer and that he loved him to the end. Isn't it? Jesus even dipped the bread in the soap and gave to Judas and said, now you do what you want. We don't quit God-given tasks. We follow our Savior, Jesus Christ. He didn't come to escape death. He came to give, give us life. 
He came to minister and not to be ministered, and to give his life as a ransom. We are not called and appointed in our places of activity and responsibility to be quitters. But knowing that our place of appointment are from God, we give ourselves to trust him and to receive his strength day by day. Yes, despair would come. Sorrows of death would compass us. What shall we do? Like David said, I will cry unto God. Now, dear brethren, very little time I have. I don't want to stretch too long. But allow me to give you a summary of this. Look, from verse 7 onwards, you're going to see language that escapes our comprehension. And he's talking about God and his ways. He's going to use cataclysmic terms, catastrophic terms, to describe how God break forth to, to help us. No normal words, unusual words, rare words. Listen, you'll be surprised. These are poetic terms figuratively used to talk about how God will help us in our troubles. Verse 7. Earth shook and trembled. <laughs> we don't know whether earth shook when David was running around, but he uses terms like this. Earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth dev devoured. Calls were kindled by it. What are those expressions in verses 7 and 8? God moving the earth and sending fire to consume everything on his way. Mountainous problems need earth-shaking forces to remove that problem. God does it. For David, everywhere he sees mountains because he cannot go to the Bethlehem's pasture where he grew up feeding his father's sheep. He's running. He's hiding in the cliffs of the rocks. Everything is like a mountainous problem. And again, God amazingly moves him through the mountains, through the cliffs, through the valleys. And finally, he came to Jerusalem. And he's a king now, sitting upon the throne, remembering all the mountains he saw. He says, wow, the Lord shook the earth. He moved the mountains. Here I am. Here I am at the place where God wanted me to be. All those obstacles melted away in the fierce wrath of God. God stood before him and put his enemies all in the corner and destroyed them by his fire, by his anger. He's using figurative terms to explain how God worked. He cannot explain this in normal human terms. Whatever God did, was spectacular, amazing, beyond description. So he uses extreme words. And now go on. Take a look at verse 9. He bowed the heavens also and came down. Darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place, and his pavilion round about him are dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Let me take a break, quickly. He uses the word darkness a lot. He said, God is in heaven, and he mercifully descended. But when he descended, he was surrounded by thick cloud of darkness. I can't figure him out. I don't know where he is. It all looks like a thick cloud surrounding me. What I see is darkness. But it says in verse 11, he made darkness his secret place. He says God is hiding. In this gloominess I feel, in this frightening darkness I am experiencing, God is there. I cannot see him. He's hiding in there. He is there. Darkness, the gloominess I'm experiencing is not a sign of God's absence, but his presence. He is here. He is present with me in my darkness. I shouldn't allow this thick cloud to fog out my mind. This thick cloud. 
should assure me that the Lord was here. He's not saying God is darkness. Because the, you see, when you come to verse 12, next verse, he talks about God as being bright. Verse 12, at the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. Wow. The brightness of God. Suddenly, like the sun that cuts through the thick dark cloud, the Lord shines. He makes a way for him. He shouldn't have thought that the thick cloud means God has left him. God is coming to shine even brighter. The brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed away. So his thick clouds, meaning all this darkness and gloomy experiences, frightening experiences God allowed, is from God. God allowed it. God is not ignorant of what's going on. He knows how my spouse is treating me. You know, even his wife, Mikal, was not a very nice wife. There were troubles in the family. But he went through all this. And he says, well, the Lord was here. I couldn't imagine I'd be here as a king. The Lord chose me. And I went through all the struggles, and here I am. Verse 13, the Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave voice his hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Here he speaks of thunder and lightning. In the Old Testament of the Bible, God often uses the word thunder to refer to his voice. Revealing of his truth. The majestic voice of God is thunderous. You know, dear friends, when we are in trouble, when we are so filled with our own fears and doubts, if you can re remember and recall God's word, it's a thunderous sound. It removes all kinds of sadness and doubt and fear in your heart. Because you remember God is good. Let's say you're troubled by your sin and you're so sad that you have all these terrible thoughts and bad things in your life. And suddenly the Lord says in his word, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive all your sin. What a thunderous word. It takes away the gloominess of shame and guilt from you. And you're released into the freedom of God that he forgives us and he receives us as his children like the loving father waited for the return of the prodigal son. He ever awaits for our return. And we rush into his hand. We forget what we were in the past. Prodigal son, wasting away all the goodness God has given. Oh, we don't think about it anymore. We were ashamed. We are very ashamed. We came with doubtful steps. Will my father receive me? And the prodigal son said, well, just receive me as one of your servants. What? Servants? No. This is my son, once lost, but now found. Rejoice. You see, the thunderous gospel voice that comes to us. Dear friends, in all your troubles, whether it is caused by your sin or somebody else's sin, there is no way you can feel totally abandoned if you open your ears to God's voice. That's why it's so important for you to remember the word of God. You must hear the preaching of God's word. You must pick up the Bible and read the Bible. You must love God's word. The more love you have for God's word, more thunderous will be the voice of God that dispel darkness and fear and doubt from your heart. They will all wither away. And you will see also God's providence putting all kinds of enemies down. God uses very unusual things, cataclysmic events, to put down Israel's enemy in the past. Under Moses, under Joshua, we see God protecting Israel by putting away the enemies using hailstones that come down, snowballs, hard, hardened stones coming down, hitting all the enemies. They didn't use spear and arrows. God sent these Natural elements to chase away the enemies. And that's what we read also at the end of verse 13 and 14. 
The highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. And he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. God has his way of destroying our enemies. God has his way of bringing people into subjection. I don't want to say too much of it, but I have seen it in my life. There were people who opposed me from being a pastor. They have said things that are really demeaning. Half truth. They won't tell all the truth. They would tell a little bit of things that they like to protect themselves. And they don't care how much damage they do to the pastor. But God has done his part to protect me. I'm standing here as a pastor only because of God's goodness. And I, I am thankful eternally. The Lord has been so merciful. I have so many th reasons to be afraid of. So many things so, so troubling in my heart. I cannot bear them. But the word of God, I love his word. It gives me such freedom of spirit. I just cast my burdens to God and say, Lord, you are good. You are my God. You are my strength. You are my fortress. You are everything to me. That's all. If you are not with me, I'm done. But with you, I can do all things. Help me one step at a time. The Lord is so good, my brethren. Trust him. Read the final testimony of David here from verse 16. To, uh, to 19. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. Delivered me from my strong enemy. And from them which hated me. For they were too strong for me. David didn't win because he was stronger than his enemy. He says my enemies were stronger than me. And that I won. Because the Lord did the work for me. He gave all glory to God. And then verses 18 and 19, as we come to the end of this devotion today, they prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. They prevented me in the day of my calamity. My life was full of calamities, calamitous life. Dear friends, there's nothing embarrassing. Sometimes we are troubled by so many things, so many disappointing things, disheartening things. So many needs, so many problems. Don't give up. Even great David went through it. God's servant. But he always wanted to be a servant to God in all his calamities. You know why? Look at the last part of verse 18. The Lord was what? My stay. He added another description to God. My stay. The Lord was my stay. My help. My sustaining power. The Lord sustained my life. Some of you are mothers, I think, struggling with your children. Sometimes I ask you, how are you, sister? Okay, pastor. The sigh, okay. <laughs> it is not easy. You call on the Lord. You will never regret the years you labored for your children. Uh, it's not easy to be a homemaker. No reward, huh? Nobody give you a paycheck to cheer you. It's the same old thing. Seldom people treat you in restaurant. You can't go out with your colleague to eat in the restaurant. Most of the time you're looking after the well-being of your husband and wife, I mean children, and you are spending most of your time in the house and working your heart out, sweating, and always praying wherever you can, not allowing your mind to be distracted. You give yourself 100% to God's Calling as a mother and a wife, it may not be the best of job in the eyes of people. They look down on you. They think you're crazy. But you bring up your kids. At the end, your tears shall cause you to rejoice. And you will never be regretful for the time you gave to God. And fathers, you who love God and want to be exemplary in the house of God, and you live uh, honest in life of contentment, godliness with contentment, will be great gain for you. But this is not an easy path. There's a lot of sacrifices we have to make, a lot of sufferings we have to endure. But the Lord is my, come on, the Lord is my stay. The 
the Lord is my stay. And the last verse for today, verse 19, He brought me forth also into a large place, freedom, freedom in the Lord. Large place means freed from all snares and entanglement. I'm no more squeezed and pressed. I'm cut loose. I'm now in the place where I, God wanted me to be, and I'm fulfilling my calling. Dear friends, that's how we get where we need to get. The Lord will bring us to the larger place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. How wonderful. The Lord delighted in me. Uh, you must be able to say, the Lord loves me. Uh, don't say because you have difficulties that the Lord hates me. But you say, the Lord delights in me. These troubles are here to mold me and make me an instrument of blessing. What matters is not my life. David was always risking his life. He counted his life nothing, actually. He put it in danger. Not that he wanted to commit suicide. Of course not. In duty, he was willing to be forgotten. He was willing to be hated. He was willing to labor with sweat and blood. But always loving God and trusting him and worshiping him. And the Lord put him in a large place. You see, dear friends, I don't know exactly your troubles. And I don't think I will ever understand. And you will never know my trouble. Each of us have our calling. And in your calling, you have great things to achieve. And that's why God put you there. That's why God gave you life. That's why God gave you spouses and children. And do it in God's way. Don't do it in your way. Don't be the mastermind in your house. Don't be the mastermind in your life. Let God be the mastermind. He is the one who plays you in larger place. Otherwise, your decisions will make your life miserable in days to come. God is the deliverer. God is the stronghold. He is the horn of our salvation. He will stay with us and bring us to the larger place of freedom in him to do his will. May God bless you.